Today we're going to be doing a dehydrating Q&A that might even include some winning lotto numbers. Stay tuned. Hey folks, it's Darcy from thepurposefulpantry.com. Welcome to my channel. Today's going to be a little different than a typical video for me. Uh, we're having some construction done in our home and so I can't do a regular filming session and so if you start hearing some pounding in the background that's our guys replacing the siding on our house so just to pardon the noise in the background if you hear it I asked my dehydrating group for your ask me anything type questions and it could be dehydrating it could be anything and most of the questions were dehydrating except for you know one but we'll get to that one so my first question is from Amanda who asked um, if you could only dehydrate five things what would they be I'm curious is it a necessity I'm curious on what is a necessity to have in my house so I'm gonna answer the first thing the second thing first um, what is a necessity in your home is dependent on what you eat in your home I can tell you my favorite things and I will tell you in a second but they may not be things that you eat so they wouldn't be a necessity for you so what you need to look at is what you use the most and what works well dehydrated that you can pull back into your daily cooking so for me my five things Green powder, which means any green vegetable, any leafy green vegetable that's edible will go into my powder. Whether it's kale, spinach, mustard, collards, uh, turnip, radish, carrot, beets, uh, dandelions, uh, you know, other edibles from our yard. Those are the things that I put in my green powder. It's what's used the most. We use it all the time and I generate more of it than anything else. Uh, another one would be just generic vegetables. So lots of frozen vegetable blends that I can get from the store because they're already blanched, they're already prepped. I can just throw them on a dehydrator, powder them, and put them in my vegetable powder. Um, anything that I have leftovers, I'll do. Uh, just little bits, I'll throw in there and let them dry, and then I'll add them to the powder. So those two powders are my, my go-tos for everything that I do. Then I would say caramelized onions um, because my husband doesn't like onions to eat um, in any form, but he likes onion flavor. But we found that car caramelized onions are actually something that he will, you know, he will like to eat. So I do those, um, but I also do regular onions and they make into a powder. Um, then let's see, that's one, two, three herbs. Any of them that I can get, I will dry because I don't like to hang them. So I dry them um, and then I put them away. And then one, did I say all of them? Did I say five? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know, but that's, but I look at the basics of what I do and that's what I would dry the most because that way I've got stuff going through all the time. We're not big fruit eaters for snacking like that. So I don't have a ton of, I mean, we do fruit when I get it, I'll dry it, we eat it, but I don't spend a lot of time stocking my pantry with dried fruits. They're more of a treat than a storage thing. So look at those things that you would want to cook the most. If you do a lot of, um, jerky then dry some jerky because that would be for you so i hope that answered your question amanda and i will leave links down below to the green powder the vegetable powder the caramelized onions anything that i mentioned in here i will leave links down in the description box below so that you can go and look at those tutorials if you need to okay our next question is for wendy okay i'm going to read this i have a small kitchen with limited counter space can i dehydrate out on my screen porch do i have to worry about the food being outside with bugs or germs uh, but not animals and or is it say or is it as safe to dry outside as inside uh Wendy it's it's perfectly safe to dry outside you just have some guidelines that you want to follow to make sure that you're making the most of your dehydrating time um most machines are created to dry in a relatively dry environment so if it's very humid outside and you put your dehydrator outside and it's uh, 60 70 percent humidity your machine's gonna work less efficiently because it doesn't have the ability to transfer the humidity from your food to the air as well as if it was a lower humidity but if it's the only way that you can do it that's fine you don't have to worry about bugs because your machine is blowing out air uh, and so the bugs generally can't get inside of it if you let it sit that's when you have to worry because then things can get inside um, but generally you don't have to worry about that the germs the same thing you're drying everything is blowing across your food, things won't settle on it. What you don't want to do is leave your food out uncovered outside where things can get to it as it dries. You don't want to under shade, you need to have it out in the sun. Uh, and if you do dry outside without cover, um, even with a mesh cover, you know, you want to pasteurize that food after, uh, but that's assuming that your sun drying out in the open. Uh, what you're doing is fine. If it's very cold, your machine will have a harder time drying. If it's very humid, your machine will have a very hard time drying. So you just need to make sure that you give yourself a longer amount of time to dry. Don't worry about the bugs. Uh, you're going to be fine. So get started. 
All right, so Brooke asked, what is the most unique use of an item I've seen dehydrated? Um, I've seen people do makeup. Uh, I've seen people create, you know, colorings for things. Um, I've seen people dehydrate things that you wouldn't normally find in the dehydrator, like not long ago. Um, we actually had to dehydrate one of my husband's absolute favorite books that he's been reading forever. Um, he spilled some tea on a, an edition of Lord of the Rings. And, um, so we quickly cleaned it up the best we can. I thought, gosh, I'm going to throw that in the dehydrator and at least get those pages dried off faster. There was still a little bit of damage to the pages, but at least we dried it off faster than if we just try to leave it out. Uh, and it turned out to actually be a good a good way to get the book a little dry, dry it a little faster than if we just left out in the air. Tracy asks, what got me into dehydrating and how did I learn so much? Uh, and where have you learned? Oh, so she's asking, you know, why did I get into it? What about, how have I learned it? Um, I'm self-taught on everything. I have taken some classes through some extensions that have been available online because the extensions near me do not offer in-person classes. Um, it would take a day's travel for me to get there. I would have to stay. Um, and then um, it's so it's not readily available for me to just go to their classes. So I've taken as many classes online as I can take. Um, I have read extensively. I have uh, I have experimented. And what got me into it was uh, when we were young and not and uh, didn't have a large budget, um, I should say. I was trying to find ways to preserve food that we weren't uh, always struggling to get groceries on the shelf all the time. And uh, if I would find a deal at the store, I would have trouble using it all up or running out of the freezer space that we did have. So I just wanted to learn how to preserve food besides freezing. I was too afraid to try canning. I was just so afraid that I was going to make my family sick that I wasn't going to try it. Um, and so dehydrating was the other option. So I started playing with it and just got a little square FD80 um, and a Nesco FD80 and started using it and started learning and just kept playing with it and really enjoyed what I was doing. I felt safe in how I was preserving. Um, I was able to serve food to my family. I was able to throw some stuff away when we would try it. It was just awful. It was before I kind of learned how to powder. Um, and so, but there was a lot of experimenting until it just became, it's the easier way for me to uh, de to preserve. Uh, it's still my favorite way. I do can now, but I still prefer dehydrating because I am more comfortable with the process. Uh, but I know there are things that I cannot do with dehydrating that I can do with canning. So uh, I did finally, with the help of a few friends online, um, decided to go ahead and try it and give it a try. And I love it. I just don't do it anywhere near as often. All right, Juanita asks, what are the six must-have foods for long-term storage? And just like with Amanda's questions, those foods are gonna be dependent on what your family already eats. Um, dehydrated foods are not meant for long-term storage for more than about five years. Um, there are some people who've gotten longer time on it. Um, the recommended time for long-term storage for food, for dehydrated foods, when you go with that safe time is 12 to 18 months, but you're likely to get much longer from that. But you don't want to push it past about five years because food begins to degrade over time uh, with quality and texture. And so it's not meant to be for 20, 25 years like freeze-dried foods are. Okay. So those six things that I would consider being important for my long-term storage will not be the things that might be best for you for your long-term storage, but things I'll think about. Basic vegetables, onions, peppers, um, celery, carrots, um, any of those kind of basics that you use a lot to form the basis of soups, stews, casseroles, and all those kind of things, I would consider those being pretty basic for long-term storage. Um, you don't want to powder them if you're going to use powders until the time that you actually need them uh, or for like that one or two months worth of time. Storing powders in the pantry is not recommended because they degrade faster. So keep things whole. Um, so look at the things that you cook most, that you use the most. Those are the things that you're going to want to put into your pantry for long-term storage. Okay, my next question is from Patty who wants to know the benefit of dehydrating frozen food. Uh, and if I, if you lose nutrients doing it. So the benefits of doing uh, frozen foods are twofold. One, it saves me a ton of time. It's already prepped. I don't have to worry about peeling, dicing, uh, cutting, slicing, or any of those things. And it's already prepped. 
I mean, it's already blanched, so I don't have to do all of that initial prep work. Uh, the other advantage is, is that oftentimes frozen foods are actually better in nutrients than stuff that I would buy off the shelf that's not in season, that uh, has come from around the world, that has spent a lot of time on a ship, that's been treated so that it stays fresh longer. Um, oftentimes those frozen foods are frozen within a day or two of picking. Um, and so they actually have more nutrients than stuff that I might buy off of the produce counter at the grocery store. Not always, but often. So twofold, I'm saving uh, time uh, and money and, uh, and prep time versus saving nutrients just in the fact that I'm getting food that might be a little fresher as far as when it was picked. Um, and whether or not I'm losing more nutrients, you're going to lose more nutrients in the blanching process of anything than you do in dehydrating. So I'm not losing more nutrients of something that's already been blanched. Um, I'm actually just preserving it for a different means. Now, when you dehydrate, you lose a little bit of vitamin A, vitamin C, because that's the way it works because of heat, but you've already lost that during the blanching process. But with some foods, blanching actually gives you more nutrients or that may become more readily available for your body to absorb from the blanching process. Um, and it serves to change the enzymes in those foods so that they last longer preserved. So there are drawbacks to any kind of way of taking care of food other than eating it fresh. But even with some things, you, blanching uh, is a better means of getting the nutrients in those things. And you would think dark leafy greens that way. They are great to eat fresh, but they also can give you more nutrition if you blanch them first. So, and I'll leave you a link down below to the green, the green powder. Um, I actually give a, a more detailed explanation about that blanching thing with the dark leafy greens. So I don't lose a ton more nutrition in dehydrating than I've already lost in the freezing process that happened in the first place. So basically I'm saving time, money, and uh, just frankly, I'm saving just the process. It, it, it works better that way. So if I can find fresh food, I mean, if I can find frozen foods on sale, a lot of times March is the best time to buy those things. Sorry, excuse that. Uh, because that's when they go on sale. So stock up when you find them on sale, uh, freeze them, they become shelf stable and they can save your freezer space for those things that are more necessary to be frozen like meats. Okay. So Leslie asked, what were the things that I was most afraid of trying that I'm now glad I did? Um, I don't... Okay, in the beginning, pumpkin daunted me cat. Sorry. Uh, pumpkin was a daunting thing for me because, uh, I, I, I wasn't in the very beginning, not getting my head around the process of cooking it, mashing it, drying it. Do I do it in slices? Do I do it in cubes? Um, I hadn't played with it yet. So it was one of those things I kept putting off, but once I tried it and did it, pumpkin is, you know, I love it. I love pumpkin flavored everything. So for me to have pumpkin powder in my shelf all the time is, is great. But it was one of those things that I, I just didn't wrap my head around the process in the beginning. But once I just sat down and did it, it's fine. I think for me, the most daunting thing about any of the projects that I tried, especially in the beginning, was not always the process, but about me messing up and then wasting food. I mean, that's the thing that I was always put off the most by because we didn't have the budget to waste anything. So um, I couldn't afford to go buy some food, dry it, and then figure out we weren't going to use it. So with things that I wasn't sure about, I would put off doing those and just stick to the things I knew back in the beginning. Uh, but over time, I just learned that, you know, this is the process. You learn how to do things. You're going to have a little waste sometimes. Powder it powder it. Don't just throw it away. Uh, and then um, once I learn those things, then everything's on the mark. Now, right now, the things I'm, the things that I haven't tried are the things that we might not necessarily eat normally. So I don't see how dehydrating them is going to fit into our life because how do I use those later? But those are the things that I experiment with now. I love to experiment to see what I can do next. So just try something. Okay. Julie asks, what are the winning numbers for the Mega Millions? Two. That's it. Two. So if you have questions like Julie's, please drop them down in the description box, I mean, in the comments box below, and I will answer them as soon as I can. I answer all the questions all the time. So uh, you can do that. Or uh, if you'd like, if you'd rather have something on your, at your fingertips, um, I have a book called The Dehydrating Basics. 
uh, facts, tips, and tricks about dehydrating. The most often asked questions that I get about dehydrating. Uh, it, it goes from the basics of prepping all the way through uh, storage and usage. Um, it's about 65 pages of information, of questions, and answers for everything that gets asked most often. So this is available on my website. I'll leave a link in the iCards. I'll leave a link down in the description box below. It's available too. So thanks for joining, and we'll do this again soon. Happy dehydrating.